Now it's my pleasure to introduce our presenter today, Tim J. Smith, PhD. He's founder and CEO of Wiglaf Pricing, an adjunct professor of marketing at DePaul University, and an academic advisor to the PPS Certified Pricing Professional Program. Uh, in addition, he's also authored several books, including uh, uh, Pricing Done Right, the value-based pricing framework proven successful by the world's most profitable companies. So with that, Tim, welcome. Ah, uh, uh, thank you. Thank you, Nick. And thank you for joining me out there. Uh, I'm very honored and to have your attention at this moment and to have this opportunity to present on this subject. Pricing day one. You just got moved up or you just got moved between companies and you're the new pricing director. Or think about this, you're the CEO and you're trying to drive something and you decide to hire a pricing or you're thinking about hiring a pricing director. What are you gonna get out of it? What are you supposed to do? What should you do? Which leads me to the Vincentian question. What must be done? St. Vincent de Paul, I teach at DePaul University, so I'm stuck with the hearing his, his statement everywhere I go in the university when I visit. It's part of the mantra of why the university exists. What must be done? They decided we must teach people things. So what must be done as a pricing director? You are hired, they expect results. <clears throat> the idea <coughs> that you're gonna take a year of listening exercises before you actually take action, that's just dead. That's dead in the water. You may have, listening exercise is part of what must be done, but it, you gotta get things done in year one. You gotta prove your worth. You gotta actually make things move forward. And the question is, is how, what, what must be done in pricing today? What should your organization expect of you? And what I'm gonna be sharing with you is what I've kind of learned from the last 20 years of listening to other pricing directors who are very successful in the role from day one forward, as well as my own direct experience in driving this. And it considers the pricing leader as an intelligence officer, as a scientist, as an advisor, as a team, psychologist and and as an organizational expert and we got to put all of these together in day one moving forward in that organization so what do i mean by this let's go to day one philosophy of science i mean in, in the philosophy of science we don't actually prove anything to be true we just prove things to be false we take measurements and we try to understand reality. You know, when Einstein came up with this theory of relativity, nobody believed it initially. When they took one measurement and they actually saw the bending of light around an eclipse sun, it was like one measurement. That's not enough to prove the relativity is true. Or when you have Schrodinger's equations and they explain something, it wasn't just one thing it had to explain, it had to explain lots of things. As scientists, we take measurements and we accept. The old philosophy may be wrong today. I mean, Newtonian mechanics is cool, but let's face it, it doesn't work with the very, very small or very, very big. We got to move into different ways of thinking. And, and that's what we do. We work with the humility of knowing at all times we can be wrong. But we're trying to drive things forward, take measurements, and understand the reality of the organization in which we work and identify a path forward to actually make progress and deliver the results the CEO is looking for. So in this process, you'll, you can't think in terms of, I took a single measurement. You gotta think about in terms of taking lots of measurements, some of them data-based, some of them anecdotal, but you gotta take lots of measurements to help put together a picture. Um, the best pricing, professionals are constantly testing their beliefs and if they're bad you throw them out and if they work you repeat you know like shampoo rinse well shampoo rinse repeat shampoo rinse repeat i'm not saying best practices or 
aren't good. There are lots of best practices. The problem is there's no one trick pony. It's not like one best practice is all you need to know. You gotta try a lot of things and then find a way forward. You gotta build a hypothesis of where you can improve profit capture, where you can reduce a profit leak, test the hypothesis, and then measure the outcomes to see if that hypothesis holds up water. You gotta be like a scientist. You also need to think like an intelligence officer. And this came up about a year ago today, news, people talking about what intelligence does. And what intelligence does is it takes a bunch of random pieces of raw data, puts it together into a mosaic, and it makes an intelligence assessment of what the situation is and what should be done about it. It's not like one piece of data or one measurement is enough to form an intelligence assessment. Nor is it that one piece of data says conclusively we know what's going to happen. It's a whole ensemble of data into a mosaic from which a rational, coherent intelligence assessment can be made. We do this in pricing too, and this is how we work. We collect information from the executives there. We collect information from the historical analysis. We collect information from the market and market research to form a picture, a vision of what can be done to improve profitability, to raise those prices. Now, warning here, you can spend all the time collecting more and more data to try to make a perfect intelligence assessment. Analysis paralysis, though, kills. Just as on the battlefield, analysis paralysis kills soldiers. In a business, analysis paralysis will kill that business. So you want to make that intelligence assessment, but acknowledge that you may be wrong. It's not a single metric that suffices. And by that, what I mean is like in the CPG goods market, they often use elasticity and try to say, okay, we should move prices up or move it down or whatever they need to do from there. That, but it's not just elasticity. I, I have news for you. Elasticity will generally tell you to lower your prices in the short run. That's not going to be good in the long run. That's just going to create a price war. You got to think not just in terms of what does the short-term decision optimization mean, but what is the longer term, what is the business, or what is the strategy of the business, and how does your pricing direction, incentives, intelligence feed in to the goal of the organization? Basic questions you gotta ask, do I raise prices, do I lower prices, or do I maintain them? And your intelligence assessment should help inform that decision at the CEO level and at the sales field level. You want to think about it in terms of market segments too. Maybe different market segments are more price sensitive than the other ones and others are less. Hence the idea some are more. So which segment do you want to go after? Do you want to be the Apple or do you want to be the Samsung? You've got a choice. You got to feed into the strategy of the organization and drive pricing there. This challenge of the intelligence assessment, not ever knowing everything, it shows up every day at a deal desk. Okay, deal desk, passe words. It shows up every day in price and in, in, in contract management and approval process. The pricing analyst says, you know, this is out of bounds, it's below the floor. Sorry, sales, not gonna do it. The sales part manager comes in and says, Oh, yeah, we're gonna do that. The problem is that pricing analyst only has one part of the information. The sales manager, the CEO, or the marketing director may have a different part of the mosaic. And our job has to be to assemble that into a reasonable, cohesive whole to move the organization forward. Alternatively, I'm in Chicago. If I say it's three degrees outside, what does that mean? Is that good or bad? Is that global warming? What should I do? 
Well, it kind of depends. I mean, as a Chicago person, if it's three degrees Celsius, I'm going to just go outside without a coat on. If it's three degrees Fahrenheit, maybe I'll put on a coat. Maybe. This is Chicago. If you live here, you get used to the cold. It's just what it is. Um, is it global warming? Maybe. I mean, what question am I asking determines what I do with that information. The data, the, mo the study of the raw data just leads to a piece of information. The decision requires the intelligence assessment. So rather than thinking that a single metric will solve your problems, <laughs> laugh at that. Instead, think, how do I assemble all of those pieces of data into a mosaic from which a meaningful intelligence assessment driving decisions can be made? You're an intelligence officer. You're also an advisor. In pricing, you generally do not have power to directly force an answer. You have advisory capability to try to drive an answer. You're like an internal consultant often. You have rarely the power to force compliance, but you do have power to persuade. In this sense, the pricing director is more like a leader than a manager. See, so the manager has power to force a decision and get rid of people if they don't listen to that decision. That's a manager. They have the carrots, they have the sticks. They can always put out incentives and pay you more if you actually do what they say. The leader has to persuade you to go to a common goal that you, following the leader, agrees is also in your best interest. You have to have a common vision as a leader to drive the group together forward towards that common goal with a path, with a plan that may need to be adjusted as you move on. Agile is good. Waterfall also works sometimes, but you're leading the team forward. You're not managing them. Our advice usually comes in two forms. Number one, and this is the basic requirement of what your pricing director should be doing, starting maybe not day one, but within a month, okay? They need to provide a target price for where those salespeople should sell. I mean, I can't tell you how many times I walked into an organization and the salespeople have no target. They just make it up as they go. And I'm dead serious. They really do. They get to make up the price as they go. Now think about how the prices is managed and how many profit leaks there are in that organization. Say pricing should provide salespeople at a minimum with a target. And then the next group up, give them a ceiling and a floor so that 90% of the sales are happening between the ceiling and the floor. Why do I want a ceiling? Well, because at some point, if I raise the prices even higher than that ceiling, I risk losing that account. I risk having that account move into buying cheaper offerings, bad mix, otherwise feeling betrayed by you and saying goodbye, and then you have brand betrayal. So a ceiling is necessary. Can they price above it? Sure, sometimes that depends upon your rules and how you wish to manage it. And a floor. 90% of the time, the price should be above the floor. And often, Salespeople just need to know where to play. And that's what you're doing. You're giving them a target and a range to play so that they have an idea of what they should be able to capture from that market, market segment, customer, customer product pairing, all the way down to the level of detail at the transaction and they know how to sell that deal. That's one, target, ceiling, floor, give them that. That's one kind of guidance that you give. And yeah, you can adjust it, but you gotta give it. The next time is trade-offs. The kind of advice that pricing analysts are really good at. Think like an economist here for a second. And the trade-offs come in the form of, if you do X, you get Y. But if you do J, you get K. Do you want K or do you want Y? You got two choices. X gets Y, 
J gets K. Do you want K or do you want Y? Those are two different things out there. And you got to give that out to them. So in that sense, it's like a, a simple trade-off. Do you want volume or do you want, market, do you want market share or do you want a price and profits? And these are real choices. Do not get me wrong. Right now, there's Beyond Beef. Beyond Beef is saying the CEO, publicly traded company, says, I really want to raise prices and start making profits. Meanwhile, Impossible Foods, Impossible Foods, backed by Bill Gates, tons of money, capital, is saying, I just want market share, I just want volume. Now, you got a choice. Profits, Beyond Food, Beyond Meat, or market share, Impossible Foods. It's a real choice happening in the market right now. And companies face this all the time. What do you think the idea of value investment versus growth investment is? Value or growth? What do you want? <clears throat> so you got to help clarify those trade-offs. When I say clarify, I mean quantify those trade-offs between growth and profit. What are the trade-offs? Or do I want to price low and capture this big market share, big market opportunity down here? A price high, forgo the huge market down there, but just capture the people that are really willing to pay me. Find out, research shows entrepreneurs of highly successful companies defined by those which grow to 200 million more or more in revenue in five years goes for the high price to the segment that wants it. But large corporations looking to make a dent in their financial papers tend to go towards market share. And you gotta make a choice which one you want. And the CEO, people often say, oh, I want both. No, nope. real world, real trade-offs. Your job to clarify them. We give advice to decision makers of which we are part of that decision-making team. And we gotta give clear advice, quantified, understood, data built up to a mosaic, to that intelligence assessment. We are advisors. Now you heard me talking about, you know, these different goals and CEO and uh, we're team psychologists too. Research by Hamburg, Jensen and Hahn out of Germany looked at about 600 and some odd number of companies and tracked return on assets, a measure of profitability, to decision-making styles. Pretty hard study to do. It's a five-year study they took on. And they demonstrated quantifiably that the, decision, that the teams that outperform are the teams that make a team decision. They looked at the idea, do I centralize it? Or do I disperse it everywhere, field people make pricing decisions? Or do I do both? And they found that centralization versus decentralization is suboptimal to having a team approach. Now, we have different people trying to call it different things like hybrid or I, I don't care about the words. The idea is, though, the truth is you got to work as a team across the organization, include those salespeople, include that CEO, include that finance officer, the marketing director, the, the chief financial uh, chief sales officer, commercial officer, sales director, whatever you want to call that him or her person out there. They need to be involved in the decision and that propels the form firm forward, either by helping them actually hit their growth targets or helping them hit their profit targets. This is how you move things forward. You work as a team. But let's be clear. A sales director may have a very different goal and incentive and concept of what truth is than the marketing director or the finance director. Yeah. So you gotta put all of these things together to try to help drive a better decision. And they'll have different incentives, different goals. Your goal is to create alignment. Alignment to a path, a vision, which they can buy into and are willing to follow. It is not the same as saying, power, you must go this way. It's, I have a line decision that we're willing to follow. We're willing to test that hypothesis and we'll see what happens. And maybe profits will go up.
we're team psychologists. We're also organizational experts. By that, I mean, think about what I'm asking for you to do. You're uh, working across the organization. You're working with multiple teams. You're also, as the director, building your own pricing team. Well, who needs to be on it? What skill sets are you looking for? How do you interact with the other parts of the organization? Pricing leaders are, to some degree, right now, an organizational expert because the pricing organization itself is still being defined. Um, we, one of the ways you think about it is how do you move people up? You start out as a pricing analyst, where if you can't do data analysis or if you're afraid of math, basically you get canceled out, counseled out of that role. You're a pricing analyst and you're looking at data, trying to inform it. So I want quant skills and I want some basic business acumen. But as you move up from that analyst role to the manager role, you're seeing the skill sets growing both in terms of forms of analysis, creating hypotheses. Initially, you're measuring. Now you're creating hypotheses about where we can make more money. Do we need to? I'll get that in the next slide. Where are those opportunities to plug those profit leaks lie? And then you're testing those hypotheses. But at the director level, we also need emotional intelligence. The EQ meter comes in. Why? Because at the director level, you're dealing with the peers. The C you're dealing with the commercial officer, the sales director, the marketing manager, the marketing VP, the uh, chief financial officer, and they are your peers. And you have to understand that the way you speak to a sales team and the way you speak to a finance officer may be different. They're what they're listening for, what they're looking to say, how you listen to them and what's important to hear from them will differ. You're gonna be somewhat a team psychologist. And you're also gonna be creating your own team to try to perform. And I've seen, if you see pricing done right, we have different ways of actually organizing this team. And what I've seen is some people organizing, so we, the, vi the vice president of pricing has a team focused on nothing but capturing the, capturing the prices in the market today. A lot of transactional analysis, a lot of where do I move this price up or down just a little bit. And then another team focused on nothing but how do I price the next product? Because these companies are always innovating. And how do you put a price tag on it? Pricing should be involved in putting a price tag on a new product. Really, really, we should, okay? So you got different ways of organizing your team. And then you also have the IT side and hmm, all sorts of things. So you gotta be an organizational expert. Which brings us to day one. Pricing day one, one, one. You're uh, using science. You're using uh, the intelligence officer spy craft concept because you never really know your competitor's price. You're just trying to assess where you fit. You're using uh, your advisory role to the CEO, to the other decision makers. You're working as a team manager, as a team psychologist, and you're building your organization, which means processes, people, routines, interfaces, actions. You got to get all this done. And so what should you do? Well, first, you're going to have to create a hypothesis. Is it that our our net price band is too big? Is it that our new product's not being priced right? Is it that salespeople don't know the target? Is it that salespeople don't have the right support to sell that target? Is it that we're misaligning, and I see this a lot, prices between the big customers and the little customers? So the little customers get a lower price than the big customers, and no one can explain why. They all just say, oh, but this, and it's like, does it have to be done that way? Can we do better? And you're looking for, you. so you're doing your price to volume diagrams, price to market segment diagrams, price to salesperson diagrams, 
price bands. You're doing all these measurements. Or and you're thinking, is it a velocity pricing problem? Meaning I can raise the price of the tails but leave the big ones alone. Or is this an account management problem? Meaning I have some accounts that absorbed a higher price and the next account did not. And so I now have an idea as to where I can help drive the price up for the particular accounts. Or is it that I have a bad accounts with bad mix and other accounts with a great mix? Can I improve the mix of the bad accounts? Where is that opportunity? Or is it that I can study the elasticity and I found that I have some things priced in the inelastic range? Kill me. Or is it that I have some things kind of priced where the revenue would go down if I raised the price, but my profits would go up? And there you got to confront the question of what do I want? Or do I just have some items out there that are just priced way too high? Where do I sit? Or is it commercial policy? Question, do you even have a commercial policy? Because a lot of companies, it's like, what do you do? Wow, the salespeople just negotiate. It's like, and what guidance do you give? Oh, they just do the, no, what guidance do you give? Commercial policy gives salespeople guidance. So do you have to, what is the hypothesis? What must be done? And if you're the new VP or director of pricing, you got about a month to form this hypothesis, maybe two in a good time. So you're gonna to have to listen to your team. You're gonna to have to take measurements from the past. And you're gonna to have to assemble that into an intelligence assessment of what must be done. A hypothesis of how you can help drive the company forward. Now, what are you doing here? Why were you hired as a VP of pricing? I'm gonna say 99 times out of 100, you were hired because the CEO, she or he, thought they had an opportunity to raise prices or improve pricing that would improve profitability. They rarely hire a pricing expert to lower prices. I hate to say that. Management can make that decision on their own. They generally hire the pricing team, the VP of pricing, to help find opportunities to plug a profit leak and improve profitability. So your question then comes, where is it? And how do you prove it? How do you prove you actually improve profitability? I got a colleague in this field who says, anytime things improve, you can blame marketing and sales. Anything, anytime things go wrong, you bring pricing. All right, I hear you. There is an option. You can use a profit bridge sometimes called the variance analysis, that's finance accounting terms, other times called a price volume mix analysis or a marketing analysis. Anyway, the bridge is published. I published a bridge in the Journal of Revenue and Pricing Management recently. You can go look it up. And you can measure, did these price changes improve profits or harm them? And was it pricing or was it volume? Or you can measure, Get my pricing initiative to improve the mix of certain accounts or improve the sales incentives so that they would sell a better mix. Did it actually deliver that? You can measure these things. And that's how many CEOs are going to judge you. Did you live, deliver measurable performance? They didn't hire you because you're a nice gal or guy. They hired you to deliver results. So day one, you better start creating your hypothesis. And by you know a month, maybe a quarter, but a month, you better start implementing that hypothesis, socializing it, getting buy-in, and then getting ready to actually roll it out and give it a go. Because you were hired to get something done. So get her done, get her done. And that is how you will deliver some results. So that is what must be done on day one as the new VP of pricing or director of pricing to drive firm performance. So Nick, I finished a little early. Sorry about that. That's quite okay. That means there's more time for questions, which I'm sure we're gonna have plenty of. So um, thank you for that. And let me just share my screen.
Um, so uh, we've had we've had a few come in already, but there's still tons of time to answer uh, questions, and we'll have plenty of time to answer uh, anything that comes in. But while you're entering, um, just a quick second to um, or a quick reminder to complete the 10 second survey while exiting today's webinar, um, and you'll be entered to win a copy of Tim's book. Uh, now, um, just to give you a couple more minutes to add any questions, a few words on leverage point. Uh, so are you selling value? Are your competitors selling value? Um, so Tim just talked a lot about how to implement a, a, a solid pricing strategy on day one. Um, but a big part of that pricing strategy is communicating it to um, uh, in, in sales context. So here at Leverage Point, we offer a SaaS solution that creates interactive digital value proposition that helps teams convey this value messaging in a more powerful customer specific way. And how do we do that? Well, first, uh, product marketing and pricing team members build custom branded value models and messages to create a value proposition uh, that helps sales tell a story. They then publish that value proposition into a cloud-based library that is accessible by every rep at your organization to customize in real time for each customer's and prospect's needs. Finally, beginning with the first sales call, sales teams can modify the customer's baseline data in real time to, or in order to create a unique business case to buy that the prospect can leverage internally to drive the deal forward. So early on in the sales process, value propositions are really, really useful in terms of in terms as flexible case studies and call prep in building sales confidence and qualifying opportunities and in engaging customer executives. In the middle of the sales process, value propositions provide customer value analyses as an important consultative selling tool to address pre-sales challenges. When you get to the purchase stage, this value proposition becomes a shared business case to buy, which is collaboratively agreed upon by between sales executives and customer sponsors. And this serves as a customer's uh, internal financial justification to purchase, as well as a sales team's asset and price negotiations. Now, who wins? Um, value propositions and uh, leverage point can be linked directly to an opportunity in Salesforce, download to a PDF or PowerPoint at any time for a personalized leave behind. Um, and on average, our clients uh, achieve five to fifteen percent higher close rates and five to twenty-five percent higher prices when using leverage point value propositions. So, if you found any of that compelling and want to learn ways to put your value-based pricing to work, just let us know in the post-webinar survey, and we can schedule a custom demo for you. Um, and now uh, we're going to move on to the Q and A part. So, I am going to put my screen on and go side by side with Tim. Everyone gets to see my um, my quarantine Beatles haircut. And um, <laughs> I think I think we're matching. So uh, so I guess the first question, Tim, you ready? Yeah. Uh, pricing data. Um, when you walk into an organization on day one, or someone is walking in, uh, what data do you find that's like really hard to find? Uh, the, the, what I do in my engagements, and what I advise clients to do when they start off this role too, is take a to your historical data group and try to compare it. I'm getting pushed back right now because COVID was a very strange year. <laughs> but still, you want to start to take baseline measurements. And the problem of me saying that is that it's like, well, what measurement do I take? Do I, which is the right measurement? I'm like, do that, please. It's not just one measurement. Try to, try to create a price waterfall of the entire business. Try to create a net price band as a percentage of the target price, if there is one. If there is none, then as a percentage of the average price for a particular product. I wanna see net price bands. I, want, I might wanna see it per segment. I wanna do box and whiskers per segment. I might wanna do, I will, you take a look at a guy, uh, Braun, was it Braun who runs uh, pricing there at, Nick Braun at Michelin? Mm -hmm. he, had, he spent a year or two creating tons of measurement, first listening to marketing people saying, you got to measure everything by these 21 different segments. Turns out those 21 different segments had no correlation to the price capture. So what you're trying to do is try to figure out, well, first, debunk the myths of the organization and to create a truth for the organization move forward. And what, when Nick Braun finally finished his results, he found the number one correlation with price for selling truck tires, lorries if you're a European, uh, lorry tires, was a uh, market share at that particular distributor. And that was the major driver of who gets a high price and who gets a low price. 
a company that was highly dedicated to Michelin tires would tend to get a lower price, not regardless of their volume. Whereas a company that you know sometimes have Michelin and other times carried Goodyear or Toyo or whatever else, they got a higher price. And this seemed to work well for Michelin tires. But it took them a while to prove to the organization that that intelligence assessment was accurate. A lot of that. Yeah, uh, and that makes sense. And I think uh, in in my, in my role, uh, walking in, is finding fi finding where everything lives is 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 one of the biggest initial obstacles. So um, uh, I can relate to that question. Um, so um, in here's one. Let me see. In organizations where the pricing function is new, where uh, in the organization do you often see the temptation to discount? Because uh, I'm sure that's a definitely a big problem. Uh, uh in industrial products it's going to come directly out of sales commercial officer if you're in europe that's where you're going to see the big discounting and cpg consumer packaged goods you see this huge bias by marketing to go for market share at all cost and i'm even hearing the marketing director says well market share is always the winner and my response to that is does kellogg's make a lot of money I mean, they make some, but, and we saw in the recent years a uh, move by Hershey's, the Hershey CEO, she, Burke, yeah, Burke is her last name, she, uh, she raised the prices of Hershey's and reduced the amount of promotions, but increased the advertising, and her profits went up, which might have been counter to what the Nelson IRI data analysis says of lower pr lower prices and you get more market share and you make more money. It's different. And it's it's hard to persuade an organization, much less an entire culture, raised in saying market share is everything when it's not. And one of the things I had to do with a person, I can't tell her name, um, can't tell her company, but she competes in the breakfast market. That'll do. That'll work. And she was saying, well, we're launching a new product, so let's go ahead and put a coupon on it. Let's go ahead and do a price promotion on it. And her biggest competitor headache is RX bars. And I asked her, does RX bars have discounts? And she was like, no. And finally she realized, wait a minute, there is actually an option here. Maybe actually, and this relates exactly to what Leverage Point is great at, Clarify the value, communicate the value, enable the frontline salespeople to communicate that value, maybe with a leverage point system here. Ta da! There you go, Nick. There you go. A little shout out. <laughs> really appreciate the shout out. And yeah, and I think one of the things we talk a lot about here is, um, you know, you, when you're selling value, and this is something we talk about, whether or not you use Leverage Point as a platform, we think it's a great platform to drive this, but it's all about organizational alignment. Uh, between it pricing is. team, marketing team, sales team, the entire extended commercial team, uh, which is which is uh, absolutely key. So that you raise a great point there. Um, got a question on staffing. So when you're uh, when you or so you when you work with people in um, that are starting off in a pricing function, maybe for the first time, maybe for uh, not the first time. Uh, what um, what capabilities are you looking for in hires? What team structure do you recommend building out? Um, merging, mashing a couple questions together here, but I think they're all, it's one team building narrative here. Um, I'm a consultant and a professor. So the way I work this might be slightly different than like say a Pfizer would, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, as a professor, I know that if you have the raw skills, I can teach you what's next. I know mm -hmm. I can do this. So I'm really looking for, do you have that pure curiosity, intellectual acumen? Can I count on you to get something done when I tell you to? Can you do math? I mean, honestly, can you? I, I teach at DePaul and I'll be, I'll be, I'll be blunt. I'd say about 75% of my, my students, they can get through the pricing class, they learn a lot, but the math really drags them down, doesn't make, doesn't feel their T. I'm like, you know, then that's fine. At least you know when to ask for pricing to engage you and you won't be asking for market share at all costs at all times. Mm -hmm. But 25% of those students, graduate students, and you know, DePaul is not a 
pathetic school. We're pretty well ranked. Um, mm -hmm. They can actually do the math, they enjoy it, and then suddenly clicks. Wait, this is all I have to do? I can do this. I can make this, I, I can make that work. And so I'm looking for that raw math skills, the raw business intelligence, and the pricing specific application of statistics or thinking is different. Now, that's one thing. Uh, half our work is about transactional analysis, improving the price capture on current things. The other half our work is about new product pricing. And that's where you got to build a value model. And we get called in, and at first the marketing director is like, what do I do with you? I don't understand how this works, or why are you asking me these questions? I told you my list of benefits. Why is it there a price on all of this? I'm like, yes, those are nice emotional benefits. I liked Mickey Mouse too, sort of, you know. I prefer Kartikek, if you know who he is. <laughs> I, I like Kartikek a lot, but uh, that's not gonna make me buy stuff that much. I need to actually show me the money, give me the wallet, give me the economic reasoning, which is, goes back into the economic value to customer. Leverage Point likes to call it Eve. They trademarked it. I use the Harvard term, economic value to customer. Um, followed by maybe voice a customer, do some sensitivity analysis, some measurements, maybe even conjoint analysis. So that's mm -hmm. a different training set where you're looking for that raw business uh, questioning, inquiry, model billing skill set. That's like creating a word problem from nothing and then solving the word problem. That requires a good algebra sense, which is different from the statistical sense of a different group so makes sense and um i can uh marry to a statistician but uh, i can tell you the statistics side is not my strong suit uh, but you did um go down the road of value models and uh value models i think are, are uh you know i think this might be relevant to the this question but um you know in terms of customer research uh how, discovering how much a customer is willing to pay for your service uh what are some good strategies to do that especially when you're kind of sitting down in an organization for the first time I wrote a white paper about product and new product development. I'm sorry, new product development and pricing. So you can find that on my website. Lays out the entire pathway. But this talk isn't just about that, so I didn't give you those slides. The start with creating that understanding of the economic value of the customer. That is always benchmark number one. Don't create measurements. First, create a hypothesis. So you first build that value model. Understand the benefits, convert them into business drivers, put the business drivers into a picture, segment it, compare it. Large farms versus small farms, big retail versus little retail, hospitals, community versus research. I don't care. You're gonna you need to segment it and then develop a pricing structure covered in pricing strategy, my textbook. Do I do bundling? Do I do versioning? Do I do coupon tariff, tying arrangements, subscriptions, revenue management? Uh, what is the metric? How do I act? How do I tie pricing back into the value delivered to the customer per segment? Now you have a hypothesis of what pricing should be. Given a hypothesis, the point of market research is to test that hypothesis before going to market. And if I'm going to work off economic value to customer, I may think a farmer uses their combine six months of the year, but I don't actually know. But I can ask a farmer how often you use your combine. I may think Union Pacific uses a train 24 hours a day, but I don't actually know. So why don't I ask Union Pacific how much they use a train? How does it vary between long haul versus short haul? How much do you use? How much is diesel? Are you forecasting that to be for the next 25 years? If I'm selling some Evolution Series green diesel from GE, I can ask for those input parameters that go into the value drivers that create a more informed economic value to the customer, from which I can estimate using heuristics, rules of thumb, how much price I can capture. I've done all that without doing any of the fancy measurements. I can also add in Van Wissendorp price sensitivity meter or Gabber Granger. 
neither of which I find to be good for price seeing, but good rather for price expectation understanding. Is the market expecting it down here, but is my value really up there? And if my value is really up there and they should be able to pay for it, given the heuristics, how do I close that gap? What's missing in my communication? What do I misunderstand about my value? Or does the market misunderstand my value because I didn't complain, explain it right? Now, the problem with Van Westendorf price sensitivity meters and Gabber Granger, I had to think of the name, is that they don't simulate a real purchasing decision. They just kind of ask, would you buy this mouse at 20 bucks? Yes or no? Well, you don't get to choose just one mouse. There's thousands of mice. You get to choose which mouse you want. And you need to simulate trade-offs. That requires conjoint analysis. See, conjoint analysis simulates real trade-offs. And that creates a much better idea of what the actual demand curve is and what your price optimization would be. But as I go from economic value to customer to the voice of customer, feedback from the market, maybe even a price sensitivity meter, because they're cheap, but I know that they're not going to give me the right price. Uh, to the conjoint analysis, I've just gone from a two to six week project to a six to 16 week project to a six to 26 week project type thing. I mean, it just got much more complex and more money and uh, you, you, you got to make sure you have the built in time to make that happen. And is it worth it? So then you start to ask, well, how much is the product worth in terms of revenue and profit? And is the 1% improvement in price accuracy worth that extra piece of research? Great. Um, yeah, that's, um, I, I, I got another question on, um, that kind of, kind of straddles both the previous two questions, but um, we see this a lot where uh, someone with the highest ranked, uh, highest level employee with pricing as a core function, let's just say they're at the manager level, um, what advice would you give them to um, manage up uh, within management to draw them into creating a core team? Um, so this is maybe if, if, if um, the pricing sits at the manager level. Uh, if you are at a manager level, like say a $50 million company, and you want to manage up, you're going to have a hard time, you, just being blunt. When you look at the pricing team itself, there's like one pricing person per billion dollars of revenue, maybe a half billion. There's a salesperson for every two million in revenue. So we're like one in 100, one in 200 people. That's just starting out, let's just be honest. But suppose your company is doing above $200 million a year in business. Then it becomes reasonable to say, no, no, Pricing should be at a director level or a VP level. At that point, you need that kind of control to make things move forward. Below that, as a manager, your job is to report to the marketing, finance, or whoever it is, sometimes sales, what the price should be and why, but you're really fulfilling the marketing person's uh, concept or the finance person's concept of what pricing should do. So it's a different role. So having caveated, how big is the organization? Now let's say you're a $200 million company or plus. I mean, I have engaged with one point, with a $100 billion company. So at this point, it's a different game. Uh, there, you know, it's like just a simple 1% rule. I think I can deliver you 1% more in price without destroying profit, without destroying volume. That 1% more in price, given your current gross margins, turns out to be X dollars. Are you willing to let me do that? And then they're gonna say, well, that sounds great, but do you have the skill sets? And well, then you gotta prove it. You know, deliver on time, deliver to your managers, build team cohesions, show people in a non-confrontational manner, as a teamwork manner, how you can add value to their decisions. Great. And um, on top of that, we have some good content here at Leverage Point about um, mobilizing, um, uh, at least on the value selling side, and um, from 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 more of a bottom up standpoint as well. Um, so if you're interested in that, just let us know in the notes, and we can um, you know send some content your way on that. Um, now, going to a question on 
uh, profit uh, profit bridge. So do you have advice on how to prove the value in business to um, when there's a more complex or configurable uh, offers? Um, so uh, more developed segmentation, maybe um, it might more developed segmentation might give rise to you know ambiguity between different mixes and offerings. Um, so any thoughts on that? So let's talk about what the profit bridge does. It measures the impact of increased volume. It measures the impact of increased price or decreased price. And, and same with volume. It measures the impact of changes in mix, and it measures the impact of changes in variable cost. Okay? Mm -hmm. Now, your hypothesis of let's change the price structure, I'll make more money. The question is, are you gonna make more money by attacking a segment that you couldn't get before? This is the idea behind versioning. I take my best product and I'll make a cheaper version. Why? It's going to cannibalize the sales of the best product. Yes, but I'll also grow the volume down in this other segment. So you got to think, am I trying to grow the volume or am I trying to grow the price? How does your hypothesis of a change in price structure feed in to improving mix, improving price, improving volume, or reducing Lisa? variable costs? And then from the profit bridge, you can say, my hypothesis said I should expect this a year later. I got that. Was this good? Plan, do, study, repeat. That's Makes giving sense. constant improvement. Perfect. Um, so well, the one on price wars. So if my competitor keeps cutting prices and offers lower price than my customer, uh, what are some tips to retain market share? Yeah, you know, the old adage for the airlines, you can only price the smartest, your stupidest competitor made by the uh, CEO of Continental back in the 70s, long, or maybe it was the 90s, long before uh, Continental became part of United. Um, yeah, there's a simulation uh, that I use in class called universal car rental simulation. And as the professor, I get to set it up so my you know competitor always prices lower, competitor does tit for tat, or competitor's just going after capacity utilization. I can set it up, predatory pricing, tit for tat. Now I have my students run the simulation three different times in the same market for three different competitors types. And what they learn is, yeah, the competitor's evil and they're irritating, but what do I want? And the consumer products students tend to say, well, let's go for market share. I'm like, is that what I told you I'm after? I'm after profitability. And about the third time they realize, Ignore market share, just focus on what delivers more profitability in my market, given my set of knowledge. And the variation of profitability is like a factor of four between the best and the worst students on these simulations. You know what really kills the profitability? Is I what? set it up so the market is tanking, meaning there's less demand quarter after quarter. And then they start losing $100 million and there's nothing you can do about it. Or I set it up so that the market is growing quarter after quarter. And there you can't do anything wrong, you're gonna make money. So the market itself is probably more important to think about than that particular competitor. I'm not saying ignore the competitors, I'm saying acknowledge them, but really focus on what your value is, to whom and why, and how much that segment will be willing to pay for you, given that they know that there's an alternative. All prices are set compared to the alternative. Better or worse, do they care? That makes total sense. And um, just one last, I think we have time for one more. So uh, what are some strategies for overcoming resistance from frontline sales, maybe even product management uh, when implementing like a value-based pricing strategy? First, they don't know what it means. So you have to like clarify what it means. Second, they don't know how much it's gonna impact their pocket. I mean, if their incentives, if they're paid on revenue, you got to show them how this actually impacts their revenue on their product line or on their customer group. Uh, you got to you got to walk them through this and show them case by case, account by account in some ca cases, what your pricing outcome suggestion implies for those individual accounts. And this is where that account matrix comes in. You know, where you look at by did they absorb a price increase? Are they getting a better mix? How do my accounts come in? You're counseling the salespeople as to where they can move the accounts to make them more money. 
Now, if you're making a price change from like say $2 to $20 in one year, you're gonna scare everybody. So you get better be able to convince and provide evidence that the market is gonna be better by raising the prices that much. Or maybe instead of doing $20, two to 20 in one year, you do it over time. All prices should be dynamic. Great. Uh, so I think that's a good place to leave it for today. Um, so thank you everyone for joining. Um, just want to give everyone a heads up that uh, we've got a really exciting webinar next month. So make sure you pre-register in the exit survey. Uh, we're going to be joined by Nimit Mehta, who will be sharing a six-step approach for optimal innovation pricing and how to capture value created. So um, you can just pre-register in the exit survey when uh, that pops up when you exit the webinar, and we'll make sure you're registered for that, and that'll be next month. So um, that'll be it for us today. So a big thank you for Tim for sharing his time and his insight and expertise uh, over the past hour. And for all of us here at Leverage Point, have a wonderful rest of your week. Take care. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.